It, it's someone who's struggling in a game. Maybe it's the business person whose business ain't going right right now. Maybe it's the marriage that we just need a little juice, a little motivation, a little inspiration. What would you tell them? Have you ever sacrificed before? Because if you've made a sacrifice in life, you know what it means to give and what it means to live. Uh, because sacrifice, that means you have to play a role. And all of a sudden you feel less than, which is a great thing. So have you ever sacrificed for somebody else? Nobody reaches success alone. You have a lot of phenomenal athletes, coaches, CEOs, or companies, but nobody reaches that alone. It all speaks for itself. Grinding the sound ain't nothing to tell. When we step on the court, we gon' bring it to light. And we stop and pop like we caught it a light. Stop asking what's wrong with me. You already know there's a dog in me. Yeah, there's no stopping my focus, man. Make sure all my people gon' ball with me. Yeah, I came to compete, I'm a dog with it. Yeah, I came to compete with my paws in it. Uh. What's up, CTA family? Welcome back to another episode of the Compete Mentality Podcast. The Compete Mentality Podcast exists to motivate, educate, and inspire you guys to compete. Our definition of competing is doing what God calls you to do, even when it's hard. We're here today to spread positivity, to shine a light, and I am absolutely elated for the guests we're having on today's podcast. Welcome to the show, Coach Conzo Martin. Thank you for having me. It's certainly a pleasure. This is uh, especially uh, special to me. Um, Coach and I were talking a little bit before the pod. As a youngster growing up around the Lafayette area and having two parents working at Purdue, um, I bleed black and gold, graduated from Purdue myself. My wife graduated from Purdue. And uh, as, a, as a youngster, four, five, six, seven years old in the – Glory days of Purdue men's basketball. Conzo Martin was my childhood hero. And I know a lot of uh, you listeners here are, are hoopers. We got listeners from all different types of backgrounds and industry, but a lot of hoopers, a lot of coaches. If there was a guy that I tried to model my game after in the driveway and pretend, it was Conzo Martin. So uh, he, he doesn't need an intro. I could go on about his accomplishments in the NBA, in coaching, but uh, more importantly, uh, as a man of faith. And if I, I was thinking about how to introduce him on this podcast, if there's one word I could describe him, it would be overcomer. It would be overcomer. And I can't wait to dive into his story. Thank you so much, Conzo, for joining us today. Jordan, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, sir. And coach, um, I got to I got to dive in a little lighter here at, at the beginning here. Uh, we share uh, a mutual brother in Lewis Jackson. He's a, a great trainer and uh, he, he's he's a brother from another mother to me. And uh, you had the opportunity to coach him. And so I got to put him on this on the spotlight here first. Coach, do you, what great Lewis Jackson story do you have to share? Oh, yeah, you got me on the spot with that one. But great stories. I mean, I, I not a lot of funny ones because he's a, he has a great sense of humor. But I, I think for him, <clears throat> the thing that stood out to me when I first met him and, and built a relationship with him when he was in Decatur, Illinois, in high school, I thought he was a phenomenal young leader. Uh, he had a passion about him. He had a drive. And even the older guys migrated to him because of his ability to lead. He wasn't afraid. He had a high level of confidence. And you felt like that guy could be a president one day. He could be the president of a university, a, a high school, because he had that in him. And he had such a tremendous amount of confidence and belief in himself. And the thing that I adored about him most uh, was his love for his mom. I mean, he truly loved his mom. And it reminded me of myself growing up. He wanted to do everything in his power to make his mom's life great. And I think that's the biggest thing about him. But, but again, a phenomenal guy, as you know, great sense of humor, competitor, uh, teammates love being around him, and he's a selfless guy. No doubt about it. Uh, well said, and he he's still the same today. And that's what I love about him and uh, love that story, Coach. And I, I want to dive in a little bit, Coach, to your story now. And we love talking about having childlike faith here in, at Compete Training Academy. 
And I want to take you back to your childhood days. So I, I just told you that you you were my childhood hero growing up. So take me back to the driveway, uh, Conzo Martin. You know, who were you pretending and dreaming you were in the driveway? Who'd you try to model your game after? Good question. I, for for me, uh, when we started playing, we used to in our apartment house, and we used to play. And we we would get the hangers, the hangers that you hold. Now these are more the, the wire hangers where you hang your clothes on. So we bend them to make it like a rim. And then we use shoestrings to make the nets. And then we put them on the door. And then we'd use socks <laughs> for balls. I mean, so we played that way. That was the best way to play for us. But as we got a little older, then we, we transitioned to trash cans. So so say, for example, in East St. Louis, you cross the street, we put a trash can over there. And then we have a trash can on this side. So we play full court that way. And we had to be careful when cars are coming through. So, <laughs> so you know how that go. But everybody could knock the ball because they were trash cans. And then we transitioned when East St. Louis, like the city, I guess, got enough money. We had basketball goals in the community. And that was the next step for us. And that, that might have been when I was probably been a, in about sixth or seventh grade. And then it just kind of transitioned from there. But my first love was always baseball. That was my love at first. But then basketball just kind of came about. I love to hear that too, Coach. Uh, my wife, Courtney, and I at Compete Training Academy, especially with the youth, we always encourage them to play multiple sports. Um, especially young growing up. Um, I think at times, especially in today's world, people can start taking things way too serious, way too fast, and that promotes burnout. So uh, would you would you say playing multiple sports helped you become the competitor that uh, you are today? I think it helped me uh, to enjoy the camaraderie of being around team and fellowship. I think it helped me more than anything. I think the competitive spirit uh, – I think I got that from my mom just to see her drive. Did, didn't know it growing up, but just her resiliency and, and working in operations, working multiple jobs, trying to make ends meet, never quitting, never making excuses. You didn't know it at the time, but it was ingrained in me just by seeing her do it. But I, I think playing multiple sports is a beautiful thing because it, it gives kids freedom to do various things, build different relationships. Because not everybody plays basketball, not everybody plays baseball, soccer, and all those other sports. So now I get a chance to develop relationships with other walks of life and other people. And I think that the best lessons are learned via locker rooms, wins and losses, but you build those relationships. So if you can play multiple sports, that's a beautiful thing because I, oftentimes when you start out as a young age and playing just one sports, that can be a, a quick, swift burnout. No doubt about it, coach. And I want to transition to talking about your college days. That's when I first became a fan of Conzo Martin. Um, I remember watching in my living room, uh, with my dad and my family and my dad telling me that Conzo Martin had transformed his game from one summer to the next. He wasn't a three point shooter. Now he's one of the best three point shooters in the country. Jordan take note of this, this player here because he's an overcomer. And so, uh, coach, tell us about that summer specifically. Um, I believe, did you attempt a three the year, but the, the year before, or was it many? Yes. Yeah, so, so my freshman year, I, I shot one, three, at, you know, it was a, it was a half court shot. So I threw it up. So I didn't shoot threes. Now I'll take you back. I didn't shoot threes in high school at all. So I was, I was more of a six, five guy. I was 175 pounds, but my game was around the rim. I was slashed or post up get steals because we pressed a lot. So that was my game, but it wasn't playing on the perimeter. So then the transition to Purdue, I was more of a, again, a, a big guy, but I had to transition on the perimeter in college. I, I Working on my three-point shot, working on my ball hand. So I had to work on everything on the perimeter. And then the motion offense. So my freshman year was a good year, but I didn't shoot any threes. Then my sophomore year, I was 0 for 6 from three because I had worked on this summertime. And then at that 0 for 6, then Coach, Coach Katie just said, so so stop shooting threes. And he meant for the season. I'm like, man, coach, I'm only 0 for 6. So, so, And I stopped shooting for the season. But I didn't stop working on them. I didn't stop working on them in, in my spare time. And then going into my junior and senior year, I really started to shoot them. I started to make them at a high clip. And I was relentless with it. Uh, and it was a beautiful thing to be able to make those threes at that high level. And I was consistent with it. But I worked on it. But more importantly, Outside of the other shots, the, the pull-ups, the, the coming off curls, the flare screens, we did a lot at Purdue. I would shoot 500 three-point shots a day. 
certainly five days a week without question, 500 a day. And I didn't go to summer school. So I worked in the summertime. So I never went to summer school, but I wanted to make sure I improved my three point shot, but I would get a lot of them up. Then I ended up making 179 in two years. And I, was, and I broke the school record and I still hold the record for percentage on three point shots. But really it came down to just confidence and belief. And, 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 and coach, coach wasn't critical from the standpoint, I don't want you ever shooting threes again. He wasn't like that. But really, as I look back and I built a relationship with Coach and I got to know him, it was more or less challenging me to continue to work on him. Because I'll give you another story, because you can sit there and say, maybe I lack confidence to go ahead and let me show Coach I can make it in his next game. Because I'll give you a flip side of that same story. Different teammate, Glenn Robinson. He was shooting probably 27 28% from three. So, you know, struggling, but he was scoring 25 points a game. So coach told Glenn to stop shooting threes. The next game, Glenn was four for five from three-point line. The next game, different level of confidence. So Glenn took and, and, and Glenn, it wasn't as if Glenn was trying to show coach up, but he just had a confidence and a belief within, belief within himself that I can do this. You know, so I, I took the other route. He took this route. Both worked out. That's an amazing story, coach. Um Man, you've been around a lot of high-level players um, as a player, obviously, but that, obviously as a coach, you've coached the best in the world as well. Um, please list two to three players that were some of the best players that you coached and what made them great in your eyes. I think what makes these guys great first and foremost, because they're all different, but it's, it's a love to be in the best version of themselves. You got to love competing. Uh, you got to have an appreciation. Even though, even if you're a leading scorer, you got to have an appreciation for your teammates. And I think sometimes that's lost or not talked about. You got to appreciate what guys do. Guys are assisting you with the ball. Guys are rebounding for you. Guys are playing defense where you're not at the level you probably need to be. And then you have to have respect for your coaches. You have to have a level of respect for those guys because they're giving you the green light to be successful. So I, I would, I would, I, I would give you all the way my version from high school to coaching. So when I was in high school, it was obviously Lafonso Ellis, where well, you see him on ESPN and Fox Sports. Now Lafonso Ellis is my high school teammate, phenomenal player. Another guy in high school, which I didn't play with him, but he was younger than me, and he's from East St. Louis. Darius Miles was a talented high school player, and then uh, college. When I, when I was a player, Glenn Robinson was obviously phenomenal, my roommate, and he's like a brother to me, so he's a phenomenal player. And there was so many in college, I, I don't wanna, I'm, I'm gonna try to give you five of them. Calvert Chaney was as rough as they came as far as scoring the ball. And again, they, they had elite level talent, had elite level coaching, coach night. Uh, so the margin for error was very slim. So Calvert could score the ball, he can shoot it, he can drive it, he can pull up, come off curls, post up. And they were constantly setting screens for him. And the guys who were setting screens were talented guys. So there was no slippage when you were playing defense. So uh, that was probably my toughest assignment in college as far as guarding the guy. Because obviously Glenn was in practice. He was a teammate. But Cal was probably the toughest. Then I would say a guy by the name of – people don't really talk about this guy a lot – Cedric Nellums. Now, he played at Northwestern. We came in at the same time. Cedric was about 6'5". I think he was maybe from Alabama, but played at Northwestern. Was a tough, tough guy. Rugged, uh, battle, compete. Just played his role. And I always respected his game, but he didn't, he didn't get the level of credit because Northwestern weren't the level of team, but they were always very competitive. And, you know, uh, Jalen Rose uh, was talented. And, and, and I'm not saying that was a difficult task. He was so talented because, and I'm saying it because of his talent level, but we mixed it up, Porter Roberts, Matt, whatever, I would guard him because they also had Jimmy Jackson. They had so many guys. So I didn't guard him at the level. Uh, now, I got teased a lot. For, I'll give you this one. I got teased a lot by my teammates by a guy named Stacy Poole. He played at Florida. Stacy was a McDonald's All-American. So my freshman year at Purdue, he was a senior. He was a talented player. Didn't become the guy people thought he would in college because of knee surgeries. And my teammates teased me because we played him in NIT my freshman year. He scored 13 points. And my teammates teased me all summer long, like, like he just destroyed me, man. And he just, and that had me motivated. But those are a few guys I thought were elite level talents, man, When you, from my standpoint as a player. Now, when I was an assistant coach, I think guys that I play, like, like Willie Dean was a high level scorer. Willie Dean could score the ball. I mean, just strong physical guard, compact, and dunk his 
he, he could score the ball at a high level. Uh, he was probably the, the one I would say at Purdue as far as, and then Etwan Moore could score. Robbie, Robbie, Etwan, Juwan, they were just different kind of guys that just came in and just took it to another level when, when I was there as an assistant. And then when I became a head coach, I had a kid named Kyle Weems at Missouri State, was a high-level guy still playing. Then at, at, at Tennessee, Josh Richardson was in the NBA. Jordan McRae was an elite-level scorer. Jerron Maiman was a guy, if he didn't have those knee injuries, I think would have been an NBA. Jordan L. Stokes, talented guys. And obviously, Kyle Berkeley, Ivan Rabin, Jalen Brown, who has the highest contract in NBA history, $304 million. Uh, then at Missouri, Michael Porter, which he didn't get a chance to play a lot due to his injury, but but one of the one of the best shooters, catch and shoot I've ever been around. And I had a chance to work out with Reggie Miller a lot in the summertime and Andy, who's a phenomenal shooter. But I would put Michael Porter Jr. up there when you talk about guys that just can reel him off and reel him off, but he can really shoot the ball at a high level. Uh, and his brother, Jonte, if he wouldn't have got injured, would be a 10-year pro as well, and he's still getting his way back there. But but so so many guys, and I'm not quite sure I missed a lot because I've always been a guy, I'm not fixated on the guys that are just elite-level stars. I mean, for me, it's all about – Everybody that has a role within the team. And I, and I take just as much pride in the best players as opposed to the guy that plays the least amount of minutes. 100% coach. Um, I, I love talking about coaching and all those players that you just talked about. Um, they wanted to be around you, coach. They, they just by who you are and the way you lead. And I want to kind of dive in to more of the coaching leadership side. Um, we got a lot of coaches that listen to this podcast. Give me two to three weapons that you use on a daily basis uh, in your coaching career and today. Well, I think the most important thing is uh, the accountability. Uh, you you have to be reliable. If, if you're a coach, you have to be reliable. You have to continue to breathe hope into your players, especially young players. I mean, and I'm not talking to say NBA guys because those are adults. But when you're talking youth level, college level, you have to continue to breathe hope. You have to instill that faith or belief in them that they know they're good enough. You got to continue pouring. And, and that doesn't mean you, you can't be critical in, in your teaching because you still have to be critical because in order for them to get where they have to go, there has to be sound counsel. There has to be honest and truthful counsel and teaching. But you have to make sure they believe. Then you have to somehow pour that resiliency in them because tough times will hit. They will hit. Are they resilient enough to overcome it? And, and some say the grit, get the grit inside them. I think you gain grit as you continue to get older and older, older through life experiences. And oftentimes I gain some of the best grit through those uh, valleys. Mm. You know, the mountaintop is always easy going. When you get down those valleys, you got to make a decision. You got to make a decision. You got to find a way to start digging real deep. And when you dig and you're planting those seeds and hopefully you're not digging for caskets. And I think it's very important to understand that when you're digging. And then I think the last thing is just simply put, and, and for me, I live by this, never give up. You can never give up. So as a coach, you point, because everybody has their own style. You can run zone offense, man to man, whatever your style is as a coach. There's so much information out there to be a coach. You just got to make sure you're doing what you do, fits what you're doing in your program. But you got to have core values. You, you have to have respect yeah. for the, the youth athlete nowadays, because, you know, when I was growing up in coaching, it was always do this, do this, do this. And nothing wrong was almost as if the coach had his finger pointing in your face, just do what I say, do. Well, we weren't necessarily allowed to ask a lot of questions like, coach, why are we doing this? I think it's okay for the youth to ask questions nowadays, because if you're good at what you do as a coach, you should be able to answer that question. And I think it's very important to understand that. And then you have to, you have to have a le level of love for your players. You have to love them. You have to love what you, do. you have to love them. Because when you love something, you care for it and you value it at a level and you cherish it. You don't have to get along with every player. You don't have to get along with them, but you got to make sure you do the right things by those players. Just like, for example, when you train young men and women, simply put, the parent is passing a baton to you to do the best job with my child. That's what they're doing. So when that baton is passed to you, you got to do everything in your power to make sure that kid gets the best version of you that day. And when you do a great job, what I find in coaching, when you do a great job, when you really pour into them, it's exhausting. It takes a lot out of you. And I think as a coach, if you're not if you're not exhausted after a day's work, then you're not doing a very good job. You're not doing any pouring. And you got to pour the cup runs over. 
Coach, I love that. And I uh, love what you said about loving the player, loving the person. And love is the highest energetic vibration in this world. Um, we need more of it in our daily life. And Coach, um, I want to talk about the love of your life, Roberta. And um, I follow your podcast. It all counts. Tap into that, everyone. It is unbelievable. Uh, it fires me up every day. But your best guess so far, I'm going to give it to Mrs. Coach. I uh, love that. I, I've listened to it multiple times. Uh, so uh, how many years have you and Roberta been married? We, we've been knowing each other for 31 years. We met the first weekend at Purdue, 92. Uh, and, and at that time, after the parties, a lot of people go to Chauncey Hill. I think they still call it Chauncey Hill. And, and there was an Arby's there at that time. Oh, so yeah, I remember it. We used to hang out there. And um, that's where we met. Now, our stories varies from the standpoint of how we met, who went to who first and all that. But that's neither here nor there. So, But but it was uh, 92, and we've been married 28 years. And, and just, just a phenomenal team because, again, we both have a love and appreciation for each other. Mm. Both are giving and caring people. We understand the role of marriage uh, and growing together because what happened and I think it's only by the grace of God, because you don't know what you know when you're young and married. Amen. But we, we've grown together. And we've been able to talk about a lot of issues and topics in our relationship. And it makes it beautiful. But I think oftentimes in marriage, people struggle with having real conversations and dealing with what's going on in our marriage. And then because we often use a buffer when we have kids, that becomes a buffer. Then all of a sudden, when the kids are gone, we don't even know each other. But we've stayed present in our relationship, and uh, and she's a she's a beautiful soul. She's a strong woman. But the beautiful her mom was a strong woman of faith. She has four older brothers, so she understands what it means to be around guys. Her brothers older guys, and they did a great job in helping her as well. Uh, but just just a great team, and she's she's done a phenomenal job with our children, and, and we work together now. Because the one thing I um, I always prayed to God was just really uh, allow. I wanted our children to love her. Mm. with a phenomenal amount of love, unconditional love, love their mom at a high level. And the same thing I want her to do for our children. Those are two of my biggest prayers and, and they seem to work out to this day. So it's been great. Uh, those are beautiful prayers. And uh, truly, I, I absolutely love that podcast you two had. And uh, for all of you uh, married couples, tap into that. It's Marriage Counseling 101 right there. I uh, love hearing your journey and two driven individuals. Uh, and my wife and I are two driven individuals as well. Uh, my wife um, played for uh, Sharon Versa at Purdue. We met at the Kissel Center um, in Fellowship of Christian Athletes, right up, right inside Ross A Stadium right there. She was a greeter. And uh, coach, we have we are eight years into marriage. Bless so us. you have... Um, I would love to tap in as I'm a 34 year old man, eight years into marriage. What would you tell your 34 year old self, eight years into marriage, uh, any advice uh, moving forward? Well, I, I would say not to be afraid of the uncomfortable conversations. I think that's how you grow. Mm. That's, uh, and, and then when you, when you forgive your partner, once you say you forgive, you got to let it go. It, it can't be, you can't bring it up two months later, three, you got to let it go. And then <clears throat> in your communication, you have to be clear about what you want. You have to be concise about it and you have to be committed to it. Um, I think oftentimes we just kind of go in passing in marriages and all of a sudden you look up five, 10, 15 years down the road and we just partners we don't we don't we don't enjoy each other's company anymore. So we got to find a way to communicate. You got to be real with each other and, and don't use the children as excuses. You have to be present. Uh, and you have to be committed to your vows, uh, but you don't want to be mistreated. I, I think, I, you know, the, the, the Bible, we, we have to respect everything in the Bible, but we also have to be sound in our judgment. The man is not an authoritative figure where he's imposing his will on his wife. It's not about that. We're in a committed relationship. Uh, we're, we're partners in this relationship. We lean on each other. This is 2023. We have to be respectful of that. The Bible was written thousands of years ago. We understand it. Yes. We can't be imposed 
rule as men on our wives. We have to respect them at such a high level because think about what do you do if your wife to see over of a company and you're a stay at home husband, how do you treat that relationship? You expect her to, to work as hard as she worked, then come home and wash the clothes, wash the dishes, cook the food. All. Are you kidding me? That's your role now. I mean, so I think we have to understand in our relationships, we have to be sound in what we're saying and we have to be committed to it. And then I think the, the one thing I would tell a lot of young couples, I say this to a lot of uh, guys that play for me as assistant coaches, head coaches, what I say to a lot of young relationships is not everybody needs to know your business. Mm. If you struggle this between you struggle together oh. between you and your wife. I love if that. If you have to talk to counsel, then talk to somebody away from your family member, your local church, yes. all of them. Don't talk yes. to any of them because they still form an opinion because there's a relationship there. Talk to somebody that doesn't know either one of you, even if you got to go out of town, but don't Great. allow people in your business. Because here's an example. Jordan, what's your wife's name? Courtney. Okay, you and Courtney. And you, you're having issues, whatever that they are. And all of a sudden, Courtney goes back and tell her mom, her sister, yeah, Jordan, he this, 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 this. And, and then all of a sudden, six months later, y'all back together, relationship is great. Well, mom and her sister has formed an opinion based off what Courtney said. They would never lose that because she said it. So that relationship is strained. Figure out a way to work it out together. If that doesn't work, let's take the next step to see, to counsel, guidance, however you want to look at it. But I would certainly do it away from anybody that knows you because you don't want people forming an opinion about you. And I think those are the keys, in my opinion. There's a lot of things that goes into it, but more importantly, just one day at a time. Be the best version you can be one day at a time. And all of a sudden, you look up 30, 40, 50 years later, it's a beautiful relationship. Beautiful, Coach. I love that, Coach. And um, learning a lot from you and Roberta through that podcast. I, I told you uh, before we started recording this podcast, when you, when you two write your parenting book, that I'm buying that first copy. So... Uh, I want to I, I want to go down kind of the same path on parenting. So I, I got a six year old and a four year old. Uh, I believe you have three children. And um, just give me a young father some advice, raising children, beautiful minds and spirits uh, to follow the Lord. What what um, what advice would you give me? Proverbs sixteen twenty four. Pleasant words are sweet to the soul. They're like a honeycomb. And they soothe the bones. Ah. And I think with our children, we got to be sweet with our words. We got to be pleasant. Mm -hmm. You have to be honest. Uh, you have to have compassion. Yes. Because when we're dealing with our kids, it's always about can we love more? Can we give more? Can we be more? And do I have more for you? And I think that's what it is. I, mean, I think as a parent, we have to give them everything we've got as long as they're with us. Yes. Because what I always say, when they're in your household, when that storm is coming, you're the umbrella, so you're always protecting them. That's it. When they leave your household at 18, 19, 20 years old, hopefully that umbrella you have to wear, they form their own along the way. So now when the storm yep. starts to come, because they will come, Yes. They built their own um, off the lessons that you and Courtney have taught them. Mm. I think that's very important to understand that. But but you can't shelter them from adverse situations. You can't, if, they, if they're struggling in little league sports, that's none of your business. If you're the coach, is one thing. If you're not the coach, that's none of your business. They have a coach. And I think that's where a lot of parents struggle and a lot of relationships are strained. The parents want to step in. Now, I will say this. If your child is being harmed physically and mistreated, that's different. Call the police, get that situation corrected. But if they're being coached, they're struggling, they're not playing a lot, that's between your child and the coach. Allow them to figure out a way to deal with that. Don't get in the car and always say, well, coach should have played you more kids. So now they form an opinion. And, and what happens, they don't have to fight as much. And then when I don't have to fight as much in that sport when there's adversity, it will transition into the classroom. I have to compete as hard. I'm trying to get an A in that class. Well, this B is okay because mom's okay with a B. And then you wonder 10 years later why they're not the level they should be because you cater to every whim when it went south on them. You cater to that need. You can't do it. You have to allow them to grow because life will be uncomfortable. And, and then the other thing as a parent, we have to eliminate eliminate that emotional roller coaster that our kids will have us on. You got to allow them to grow through it. You got to allow them to grow through. You got to sit back. Just sit back. Oh. Pray to God. But when they see you, there's confidence and composure. And I think it's very important as parents sit back. If somebody's coaching, 
let the coach do their job. And I think for you as a parent, it's one day at a time, be the best version of you, but, but be present because I'll tell you, in my years of coaching, trying to be the best and you're working so hard, you know, lack of sleep, you're in the office all day long. And, and what happens, you come home, we have dinner as a family. Well, my body's there, but I'm not present. Hmm. I'm not present. The phone rings, I'm going to take a phone call and all of a sudden we, we was at the dinner table for an hour. I was yeah. gone for half an hour, half an hour. If I was there, I wasn't present. That's not good. Mm. So you got to be able to, once you walk in the house, and what I tell a lot of coaches now, once you walk in the house, drop that phone. Have in your mind a two-hour window, three, whatever the window is, that phone is dropped. It, yeah. Because the most important people is in the household now. Put the phone right there. Do what you need to do with your family. And I think that's very important. Such great wisdom, Coach Martin. I appreciate that so much. And it, at Compete Training Academy, we got seven different training locations. So we deal with lots of parents on a daily, weekly basis. And every time parents come to me and talk about uh, advice for their kid, um, I tell them <laughs> that there's a, God chose you to be their parent. Out of all people, he chose you to be their parent. And to help raise their beautiful minds and spirit, you can hire anybody to be coach and trainer. And I tell them with my own kids, they always say, you're going to train your kid. You're going to coach. Kid. Maybe we'll see if it works out, but I can hire that out. I can't hire dad out. I can't hire mom out. So those words were, were so wise right there, coach. Coach, um, we, we love talk. So at Compete Training Academy, truly. Basketball drills are drills. There ain't nothing uh, under the sun that's a secret. There's no secret to success. Um, but what makes us different at Capi Training Academy is what you embody, Coach, and what you've inspired me by your mentality, you, your, your overcoming mentality, uh, the compete mentality. We define competing as doing what God calls you to do even when it's hard. So I want to come to you, pretend my mind, I'm a player, I'm coming to Coach Martin. My mind's not right, Coach. My mind's not right. I need some juice. I need some fire. Uh, we got a lot of people listening to this podcast right now who may be stuck in a rut. Maybe they're stuck in a rut. Maybe life's not going good, and they just need some juice and fired up. Take me to the locker room of Conzo Martin and put some juice in my bones. So now this is a young man that's dealing with stuff off the court or at the halftime of a game. What's going on here? Yeah, it, uh, it, it's someone who's struggling in a game. Maybe it's the business person whose business ain't going right right now. Maybe it's the marriage that we just need a little juice, a little motivation, a little inspiration. What would you tell them? Have you ever sacrificed before? Because if you've made a sacrifice in life, you know what it means to give and what it means to live. Uh, because sacrifice, that means you have to play a role. And all of a sudden you feel less than, which is a great thing. So have you ever sacrificed for somebody else? Because when it's all about you, you have to learn to grow into a family and a team. That's a camaraderie. Because nobody reaches success alone. You have a lot of phenomenal athletes, coaches, CEOs, or companies, but nobody reaches that alone. Yes. So now you have to understand the value of family. Have you ever loved before? That's what I'm asking. Have you ever loved before? Give me an example of love. And you start to pull things out of them. Do you appreciate life? What is it about life that you like? When you're walking down the tree, street, you see the trees, the lights, the squirrels. I notice all those things. I don't take life for granted. Mm. Because if you able to breathe, you got a chance to live. And you got to pour into somebody. What I found in my life, and I find the best job when I pour into other people. So that's why I always tell people that are struggling. Have you ever poured into anybody? Yes. How are we? Can you hear my dog, Jordan? No, it's all good. But now we know. So, yes, but you got to be able to point to other people. When, when it's all about you, that's where you struggle. You have to be committed to somebody else. You got to be committed to doing other things to help other people. Mm. And then you have to embrace the uncomfortable. And I think that's very important because there will be bumps in the road. There's always bumps in the road. But let's overcome them. You can be very successful. But then you got to, I think more than anything, we always got to have somebody we can lean on. Is there somebody I can lean on when times get hard? And when you can lean on somebody when times get hard, that 
it's very few people in this world that you can call and really trust and say, well, I can talk to you about anything and it stays right there between us two. There's very few in this world and you have billions of people in this world. Find people that you can truly trust and lean on when times get hard and they'll be candid with you. And I think that's the best way to grow. But for me, it's just always try to get to the root of every situation because if you can't get to the root of you know, that tree won't grow. Mm. Amen. Amen. You're making the hair on my neck stand up. Give me goosebumps, coach. I, I'm I'm fired up being in Coach Martin's locker room. Uh, coach, uh, as we wrap this podcast up, I got to give your son, Chase Martin, a shout out. Uh, man, I, lo I love training him, but I love our conversations before and after the workout more than even training him. Uh, give us a story of you and your son growing up um where you guys uh went through uh some adversity together or or something like that and on the back side you're grateful for it oh man there, there, there are a lot of situations like that I, i'll try to come up with stories but like when when he was little so now man again struggles as a dad but when he was probably we lived in indy so he's maybe four or five years old and he he man you can if you made him stay in the house, he did something wrong. You made him stay in the house because he was feisty as a little guy, man. He was all over the place. That mouth would never stop going. But if you made him stay in the house, he would lose his mind. He wanted to be outside. The snow ran. He had to be outside. Just He had to be a part of action. We were in a neighborhood. A lot of young boys about his age, too. So that part was great. And, man, one time, so he had a, he had a rash. I mean, like a poison ivy or something like that. So we had to put a little medicine on it. And so he had to put it here. And me, I guess, not reading the direction like I should have. I put the stuff on him. I'm, I'm not a kid, kidding you, George. His eyes puffed up. He could he could barely open his eyes. His face was swollen. I mean, it was really swollen. But but he loved to go outside so much. He still went outside and played. And, and he couldn't even tell the kids were teasing him because he just wanted to be outside. He, he wanted to go to school to be with his friends. He went to school like that. And, you know, the parents like, man, what, what are his parents doing? The teacher's probably like, man, what, what, what's up with his parents? I mean, but but he had to have it, man. He just, I mean, this man went to school his eye. And I don't think my wife and I, we ever took any pictures of that. I, I, I wish we would have, but that's the type of guy he was. But I think the other part when he got older, so he missed his whole ninth grade season because he had a, a leg injury. So they had to put a rod into his leg and his femur. Yep, remember. And that was a, yeah, and, and and when, you know, you come out of the anesthetic and you come in too, you start saying anything, man. The stuff he was saying was hilarious, but I, I didn't record that either, man. It just, it's like, man, where'd this guy come from? I need, I need to watch it. <laughs> just, but, but he, but he has a, he has a great sense, sense of humor, but he also has a seriousness That's about him as far as, as and, he, and he applies himself on the court as well as he does oh, in the classroom amen. at a high level. And he's efficient with his time. It just, he can write a book on managing your time, being efficient about your business, and consistent in your everyday approach. And I'm, you know, I'm 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 happy, grateful, and excited for my kids. But but I was that when I saw them come out of the womb. So I was already that, and uh, that doesn't change for me until they put me in the casket. Hmm. I, I love that, Coach, and uh, truly uh, cannot wait to see what the Lord has in store for Chase. I know their plans to prosper him, not to harm him, and plans for hope in the future. Uh, yes. Coach Martin, final question here. I always end this podcast with this question for any guest. Uh, the book of James talks about adversity a lot in the scriptures. And it's coming. It's coming. It comes every day at us. Um, and I, I, I mentioned at the very beginning of this podcast, when I look at you and your life, uh, and it, that's why your podcast and your message and your brand is impacting thousands upon millions of people all across the world now because you're an overcomer coach. So please share with our audience uh, of a time you experienced adversity in your life and you fought through it and you had that Romans eight mentality. If God is for us, who can be against us? And you overcame something and hindsight being 2020, now you're grateful for it. Man, Jordan, that's a lot. So I'll, I'll try to keep that a few, because that's a lot of them. And again, I think for a lot of listeners, especially in the state of Indiana, and I know you have people all around the country listening, but I was diagnosed with cancer at 26 years old. And in that process, I was playing professional ball in Avellino, Italy. 
and I was running down the court and it, and I was running, breathing like this. And then at half court, I just passed out. Mm. And uh, they did test x-rays and blood work in Italy. And they just said, you need to get back to the States immediately. And the next day, my wife and I, my son, Joshua, Josh, my oldest son was four months at the time. So we flew back from Rome, New York, New York to Indianapolis. And then we went to the hospital in Indianapolis and the doctor just said, I don't, I don't know if you're going to die, but this is life threatening. Mm. And they found a tumor size of a baseball between my chest and lung area. And I did chemotherapy for about four and a half months. And uh, that mm. was uh, a very, very tough time because I think that was probably the first time in my life that I had no control over the situation. No control. Outside of prayer, I had no control. So I, I had to lean on God, of course, and I was already doing it, but I had no control but I, but I will say in this, and this is hard to say this part, uh, there was a level of peace. If I didn't make it out, there was a level of peace that God had over me. So I will say that part because I was so exhausted and I had nothing left in me. And so by the grace of God, I'm still here. But in that, my biggest prayer to God, when I was going through that, I just said, allow me to see my son, Joshua, turn 18. At that time, he was four months. Now he's 26. Mm. So God has been faithful, grateful to me. But I think we have to understand one thing as people, especially when you live for Christ, uh, the storms will come to wake you up, shake you up or break you up. And you got to be ready to receive them. You got to brace yourself and receive them. Your roots have to be planted deep. Your mm. roots have to be planted deep. And, 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 and the way you plant your roots is through prayer, through reading, through scripture, it's getting strong in the word, uh, Absorbing the Holy Spirit. That's the only way, man. If you're not braced in it, if you're not entrenched in it, those leaves will fall off that tree and blow, and all of a sudden you're in the wind and you're gone. I think you have to have a foundation. But again, I go back to you have to have people you can lean on to talk to, that, whether that's sound counsel, where you're not being judged by what you're saying and what you're doing, and understand the word. The better you can understand the word is a beautiful thing because you know that you know there's a God. And it just gives you a tremendous amount of strength. And I've truly believed that. Then the other part I'll leave with the last part. And this is, this is why when I got old enough to understand, this is why I was fighting so much. Because I, when I left East St. Louis at 18 years old, it felt like I had boxing gloves on and track shoes on. I was running. Fighting, running, swing. I didn't know where I was running, where I was going, but I was fighting, running, swing. But all, all I knew is I wanted to make my mom's life better. That's all I knew. And by the grace of God, he was blessing my path every step of the way. And he continued to do that. And I think with the All Count podcast, I think all people all over the world, we have people in Africa li listening to it. Yep. But the All Counts podcast is for everybody. It's for all walks of life because it's real life stuff. It's uh, I'm not bringing guests on just to be fun and having a good time. We're going to do that, but we got to be real because everybody goes through something. Yes. Uh, and we, we pour our souls into because it's ultimately about helping people because my goal is trying to reach the world. And that's what I try to do with the All Counts podcast. But it's a it's a tremendous platform for us all to continue to grow together. Amen, Coach. And, and along that note, uh, you're, you're on a mission. And I, I see that. And um, please give our audience, there's going to be people all over um, the country and the world listening to this as well. How can we follow the All Counts podcast and you yourself? Where Where can we go to get you? Uh, well, it all counts podcast and that's on uh, YouTube, Apple TV, Spotify, all your social media platforms. But how you follow me is Coach Conzo. And I'll spell Conzo, C-U-O-N-Z-O, -O, Coach Conzo. That's a unique name. Uh, I'm not sure you'll find another one in the world outside of my son, Joshua. Now, the other ones might be spelled differently, C-O, because when I went to Italy, the people named Conzo Quanzo, but it's C-U-O-N-Z-O, -O, Coach Conzo. And I think it's a great platform. And I communicate uh, with our listeners. Uh, we go back and forth because it's real. I don't have nothing to hide. And I got plenty of time on my hands. So that's a blessing. So it's all good. <laughs> amen, amen, and amen. Audience, I know, um, man, this has been an unbelievable podcast, if not the greatest podcast episode we've ever had on the Compete Mentality. Do yourself a favor and go follow Coach. Go, go subscribe, like, share the podcast. I know a lot of a lot of my close uh, circle. I know every time I listen to the All Counts podcast, I hit share, bang, bang, bang. I share about five, 10 people every time. Go do it because we got to get the message of it all counts out and shine the light to this world. 
that Coach Martin is bringing. Coach, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jordan. And also the podcast, the latest episode, Carl Seaton, S-E-A-T-O-N, uh, one of the best directors in the United States of America. We're talking Godfather Hall in Chicago, The Shy, uh, Snowfall. He's done a phenomenal job. And But more importantly, outside of that, <clears throat> he's teaching a master class on getting up when you're falling down, struggle, battling depression, all these things. He's teaching a master class. So I think everybody want to hear that one as well. And then the one on Thanksgiving Day, Woo. the one on Thanksgiving, it's giving day. That should be the most listened to podcast in the world. The one on Thanksgiving Day, man. It's about because November is Men's Wealth or Health Awareness Month, and uh, I have Dr. Adam Allo, and we talked about some powerful things. So I think you want to listen to that one. I uh, I truly, it's like I, I'm a podcast guy in the morning. I, I'm very routined in my in my morning and evening routine, and in the morning I get in the Word and. I work out and I, I I turn on a podcast while I'm working out. When I see that, it all counts. Comes up. It's like Christmas morning. I'm like, ding, let's play. And I, I'm juiced. I had to get a couple extra reps in the weight room, coach, uh, every time I listen to the podcast. So uh, truly, it's been an absolute honor uh, for you to be on here. Thank you for inspiring me for decades since I was a youngster. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you here today on this podcast, Compete Training Academy. Leave inspired. Always remember that competing is doing what God calls you to do, even when it's hard.